morning and welcome to the morning worship service here at the Bremen Church of Christ. For those visiting, we're certainly glad you decided to be with us. Please take just a moment, fill out an attendance card. Visitors and members alike, pass that to the center aisle. We'll pick that up at the uh, conclusion of our service so that we may have a record of your visit here with us today. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock on Sunday evenings, then again 7 on Wednesday for our midweek Bible study. Well, Johnny McDaniel is our song leader this morning. First song. 203 is our first song, if you wish to begin to turn to that. 203. Brother David Wilson will lead our minds in prayer at the appropriate time. Brother Sidney White will bring us a message of the hour, and Jimmy Allen will conclude our service in prayer this morning. Several on the sick list I wish to bring to your attention. Gail Woody's brother, Wayne Coffin, has developed blood clots in his legs. He is not doing well. Eloise and Sue's brother, Claude Bearden, had uh, surgery this past week, but he came yesterday or a couple of days ago to the home of Sue to announce that he was not doing well. He does have other health issues, and your prayers requested on his behalf and his family at this time. You're also asked to remember Wanda Owens. This is Cheryl Edwards' stepmother who has upcoming tests. You're also asked to continue to remember Richard Wheeler. Pam Wilkes is to have outpatient, outpatient tests uh, this coming Tuesday and Wednesday at Tanner in Carrollton. Also, Christy Ritchie asked us to remember her uncle, Mr. Philpot. The area-wide singing is uh, hosted by Bremen this month, and it will be this coming Friday, June the 26th, beginning at 7 o'clock here at this facility. Let's help uh, remember and bring plenty of finger foods to uh, host our guests that will be coming for the fellowship following the singing. Again, the area-wide singing is hosted by us here at Bremen this coming Friday, June the 26th, beginning at 7 p.m. Brothers Keepers Group 3 is also uh, planning an upcoming meeting this coming Saturday at 6 p.m. at the home of Frank and Lola Head. You're asked to bring Finger Foods. Again, that's Brothers Keepers Group 3 meeting this coming Saturday, 6 p.m. at the home of Frank and Lola Head at 6 p.m. Hopefully you're well aware that our camp, Bremen's Week at Camp Inigahi, begins this afternoon, approximately 3 o'clock this afternoon. And several of our young folks will be participating in camp this week, mostly as campers, some as counselors. Johnny tells me that he's thankful for the support that the Bremen congregation has offered the camp over the past several years. We do have a few campers that have come to us here lately that wish to go to camp, and if you would like to help defray their needs, the cost is approximately $150 for the entire week of camp. If you would like to help in that effort, we do have a few that are in that category. Please see Johnny as soon as possible after services this morning. He will be leaving shortly thereafter, he and his family, to begin preparation for camp, which again begins this afternoon. And we'll go through Friday. Now, there will be uh, devotionals each evening at camp, beginning at 7 p.m. If you wish to go out to camp to hear those devotionals, you're certainly welcome to do so. And if you want to be there an hour early and help them feed the young'uns, you're also invited to do that as well. Also, you may have noticed in the foyer, we do have some of the Georgia Agape change cans. If you wish to help in this effort, this is a fundraising effort for a Christian adoption agency that we support here, Georgia Agape. You can get one of these cans and get one of these slips of paper, which indicates who you are. Fill it out, drop it in the can. You can have it at your home and fill it up. And if you need more, we got plenty back there, but we'll have those through about mid-September. We'll get them back to Georgia Agape at that time. Let's begin our service now. Bow with me as I pray. Father, we're thankful that everything is as well with us as it is, that we have this fine opportunity in this nice place to meet with those of like precious faith that worship Thee in spirit and in truth. We're hopeful that our worship to You today, Father, is acceptable. You'll be pleased with our effort. We'll be edified as a result. For those that we mentioned this morning that desire part in our prayer, we ask that You watch over and care for them. Christy Ritchie's uncle, Pam Wilkes, as she has tests this week. The Wheeler family, as they tend to Brother Richard's needs. Cheryl's stepmother, Wayne Cawthon, in his time of trial, and the family that tends to his needs. And we also ask 
Father, pray at this time for Brother Claude Beard as he struggles with his physical condition and his family that struggles to help support him in this time of trial. Continue to watch over all these and all others that we may not have mentioned that we know that desire part in our prayer. Be with Brother Sidney as he breaks unto us the bread of life. Brother Johnny as he leaves our song service this morning. We also ask a special prayer at this time for camp that begins today. Much, may much good come from it as it always does, Father. Continue to watch over and care for us. Forgive us when we fail thee, for this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing number 203. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies to his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord. Before the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 257, 257.
you bow with me as we give thanks for the bread? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity we have to gather here to partake of this bread, representing the body of your Son, sacrificed so we might have hope of eternal life. We pray that this will be done in a manner pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask this in your Son's holy name. Amen. Has anyone been missed in serving the bread? Let's pray. Dear Father, please bless this cup, which to the Christian represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to partake of it in a well-pleasing manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We overlook anyone in our serving. Be with us now as 
we give back a portion of the material blessings that you've so graciously bestowed upon us. We pray that this will be done not grudgingly or out of necessity, but with a cheerful heart. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen. One hundred sixty six. One six six. O worship of the King of the Lord.
bow with me, please, as we pray. Our most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come before thee, dear Lord, at this hour, asking your forgiveness of any sins that's in our lives, dear Father. So that this prayer, dear Lord, might be received in an acceptable manner to Thee. We're so thankful, dear Lord, for Your Son, for Your Word, for the encouragement that it gives to each of us here, dear Father. We pray, dear Lord, that the songs that we have sang this morning, the message that we're about to hear, dear Lord, will be received in an acceptable manner, dear Father. Dear Lord, there are heavy hearts here this morning over loved ones that are sick. Loved ones, dear Lord, that we may have to say goodbye to. We ask, dear Lord, that each of us here have kind words to say to, to these individuals, that we can encourage them. We all know, dear Lord, that Brother Claude Bearden is a good Christian man. We also know, dear Lord, that he loves thee dearly. We know, dear Lord, that through these trying times for him, I've, I've heard that he is cheerful and happy. We should all be envious of someone that is that ready to meet thee if he has to. And we know only you know the time and the hour of that time for him. But we just ask, dear Father, That if you can put your healing hand on him and restore him to his much wanted health. We're also mindful, dear Lord, of others that Brother Chris mentioned. We pray, dear God, that it's in thy will that you administer unto them the things you know they stand in need of. We ask, dear Lord, that each of us here this morning examine ourselves dear Lord and we're doing the things that you know that we have the talents and the ability to do we pray for this congregation here dear Lord and pray dear Father that that we continue to strive to do thy will we pray dear Lord for our elders for their diligence for the well-being of, of your church here dear Father we pray, dear Lord, that you continue to strengthen them and pray that each of us here can give them words of encouragement. We pray for Brother Sidney, dear Lord, as he strives to bring to us the message. Your word, dear Lord, may each of us dismiss all thoughts from our minds, dear Lord, that would distract us from hearing your word, dear God. We ask, dear Father, that, that you believe with the daddies of this congregation of the church the world over. Give us the strength, dear Lord, to be the type of example that you would have us to be for, thy, for your kingdom, for your honor, and for your glory. We pray, dear Father, for our young men and women that are and especially our young daddies that are overseas and on foreign soil at this time, that are unable to be with their families. Comfort them, dear Lord, and allow them to return. Continue now to watch over and protect us. Forgive us when we fail you. And dear Lord, we pray for that home with thee. Amen.
The invitation song this morning will be number 218. Please mark that. We'll sing that at the conclusion of the lesson. Before the lesson, we'll sing number 72. 72. Let's stand for the song before the lesson. I'm pressing on the upward way to have Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to continue our study this morning of the letters to the seven churches of Asia. We'll begin looking at the church at Sardis in just a moment. It is good to see each of you present this morning. Those who are visiting with us, we are delighted that you're here. And no doubt some of you are visiting because it is Dad's Day and we certainly extend our congratulations to all the fathers in the audience and certainly it's good to have you in our audience here this morning. I appreciate all of the uh, statements that have been made relative to being missed and glad to have me back or whatever. It said in the Bible class, seemed like I've been gone about two or three months, but it really hasn't been quite that long. But uh, three fast-paced trips in two weeks' time is more than I care to do on a regular basis for sure. I, I sympathize with Guys like Chris who have to be on the road all the time, I, that's just not something that I, I enjoy doing that much. But we did have a, a good meeting in Indianapolis. I uh, did miss the singing here. Uh, in Indianapolis, some of you have been up there, they have a building that will seat about 800 people. It is a humongous thing. And Sunday morning they had 127 or 29 present for worship. And they scatter all over that building. It'll hold 800 people. And so the singing there is just not what it is in Bremen. As a matter of fact, a couple of times, and no reflection on them, but I, I mentioned in sermons about singing and being enthusiastic and whatever. I said, when you go to Bremen, the only time you hear the song leader is when he starts the first part of the first verse. And then from there, you don't hear him anymore because the singing is so fantastic, and that's certainly a um, commendation of this congregation for the way you participate in our song services here. You sing with the spirit and with the understanding, and that's certainly to be commended in that regard. But it is good to, to be back, and certainly those of you who are going to, to camp this afternoon, we uh, wish you well in the week uh, that you have ahead of you. I know it's a very busy week, for those uh, staff members who uh, put this thing together and see that it goes on as smoothly as possible during the week, uh, certainly a 
tremendous task that you have before you, and we commend you for that. Those who will be campers, we trust you'll enjoy what has been prepared for you, that you will not only enjoy the recreational and social pursuits that will be there, but you'll enjoy uh, the, the scriptural aspects of it, the Bible studies and so forth, that you'll benefit in, in that regard as well. Uh, Johnny always gives me the privilege of speaking at one of the devotionals, and Lord willing, tomorrow evening I'll do that, and always enjoy that time together with, with the campers there. But we wish you well in your week ahead. Revelation chapter 3, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. As in the other letters that we have noted previously, the one who is responsible for this letter says, I know thy works. And as we have emphasized in the previous studies, God's knowledge of what's going on in these churches is an absolute knowledge. It's not partial knowledge. It's not a prejudiced knowledge. It is an absolute factual knowledge of their spiritual condition. And the things that he says unto them are things that, that they can rest assured will come to pass. He, in this letter, has the two divisions that we have mentioned in the, in the other letters, that is, points of commendation and points of condemnation. In this regard, relative to the points of commendation, he simply says there are a few, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. That is, in spite of whatever else was going on in the church in Sardis, there were some brethren there who were holding fast to that which they had been taught. You'll note in the um, verse 3, he says, on the other side of the coin, to those who have not lived as they should, that they should remember how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Well, obviously, there were some in Sardis who were already doing that. They had had the truth taught unto them. They had obeyed the gospel. They had instruction as to how they were to live the Christian life, and they were holding fast to that. That is exactly what we are instructed to do in our lives to hold fast to that which we have heard. In Peter's writing to those brethren, 2 Peter chapter 1, he encourages them of that which they had received and the need to hold fast to it and to be diligent in their observance of those things that had been commanded of them. In the closing part of 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So often throughout the pages of the New Testament, the encouragement to us is stand fast, hold fast in that which we have been taught. 
that not only stresses the importance of our holding fast, but it stresses the importance of that which has been taught. So often is the case, as again is mentioned repeatedly in the New Testament, there were occasions when something other than truth has been taught. For example, in Galatians chapter 1, beginning with verse 6, Paul said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then he went on to say, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It is imperative that what is taught to the church is the truth of Almighty God. And when that is the case, then those who hear that truth must be diligent in their observance of those things which they have been taught. And so in the church at Sardis, there were those who, even a few names, who were obviously holding fast. They had not defiled the garments. With respect to those people, Jesus through John says, They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. A tremendous promise that is given to the child of God who will be faithful in his service to God. The opportunity to walk with God. You recall a number of passages, no doubt, that instruct us in the Christian life here that we are to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called, Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 1. So even in this life, the Christian life is likened unto a walk. In 1 John 1, 7, John says, If we walk in the light, if he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. So there is the necessity of walking in the light. And so these brethren in Sardis had obviously done just that. As a result of walking in the light here, as a result of walking with the Lord here, they will now have the opportunity to walk with the Lord in the life beyond this life. And so they need to remember how they are to walk. We have been noting in our Bible study class in the auditorium for the last couple of weeks, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, in which Paul says to Titus to teach the brethren, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's the importance of walking in the light. There's the importance of being taught the truth and then living according to that truth. The end result is we will be able to be with the Lord. They'll be able to walk in white. They will be clothed in white raiment. And he says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. What a blessed thought it is to obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to know that upon that basis our names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. And so long as we are faithful in that regard, our names will remain in the Lamb's book of life. You recall as a, some description of the judgment is given to us, we are taught that we will be judged out of that book of life. The books were opened and another book was opened. We'll be judged in reference to the Word of God. Those books are obviously referenced there as well. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, His word is revealed to us and written down for us in what we call the Bible or the Scriptures. And so we'll be judged out of the things that are written in this book. 
how well we have lived our lives in harmony with these things. But also present is that Lamb's book of life in which the names of the faithful are recorded. What a blessed privilege that is. But at the same time, it would certainly encourage us to examine ourselves, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, whether ye be in the faith, making sure that our names have not been blotted out of that book of life. And so he closes this letter with the exhortation, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we need to hear that today, don't we? We need to listen to the Word of God and then make application of that in our lives so that we can have our name in that Lamb's book of life and so that it will remain there and not be blotted out. We need to walk in the light today so that we can walk with Him in white when this life is over. A tremendous promise that is given to every faithful child of God. But as in some of the other letters, there is as well points of condemnation. Things are not as well in Sardis as some believed that they were. And concerning that, he says, I know thy works. And again, he knows the truthfulness of the matter. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. There is a difference, and we sometimes emphasize this, but there is a difference between character and reputation. And here Jesus plainly emphasizes the difference between the two. He speaks first of their reputation. You have a name that you're alive. Now he doesn't specify in this particular letter exactly what is involved in that statement. When you think about the city of Sardis itself, it was a very prominent, very busy, very commercially oriented, very wealthy city. There is the possibility that some of that had found itself in the church of our Lord in Sardis. Those who are, are recognized as being wealthy in the city. Those who have a good reputation in the city. Those who were men of renown, if you please, in the city. And uh, there is also the distinct possibility that they were doing some things right, good, and well. And thus would have received a good name in the community in that regard. But he says you have a name, you have a reputation that you are alive, that you're well, everything's going great. Now this will be somewhat in contrast to what we'll find when we get down to the letter to the church at Laodicea. What we'll find there is what those brethren thought about themselves. In this particular context, this has reference to what others thought about the church in Sardis. Whether it was other brethren in other places, whether it was people in the city, a lot of the specifics we are not given. But what we are given is that their reputation was good, but their character was bad. You have a name that you live, but you are dead. Their need was like the need of a lot of churches today. They needed reviving. And the thing that they are told is, Remember, therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. In other words, they needed to get back to the truths that they had been taught. They needed to get back to what they had heard. They needed to hold fast to what they had heard. But in order to do that, they were also going to have to repent of those things that were amiss 
in their lives, in the life of the congregation, whatever those problems might have been. They had a serious responsibility in that regard. It might be, or seems to be the case, in what is said in this letter, that they are much like those that Paul described when he wrote the second letter to Timothy. Chapter 3 and verse 5, Of some, he said, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And so there's something that they need to do. They need to repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch. Well, see, there's the responsibility to watch. Timothy was told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, but watch thou in all things. Do the work of an evangelist. There were areas wherein he needed to watch. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, down about verse 13, we are taught to watch. And numerous passages throughout the scriptures. We need to watch, number one, for the devil. Because he is after every one of us. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. The idea of vigilance there carries, at least in part, the same idea as watchfulness. So we need to watch for the devil. Watch for those areas wherein he is going to attack us and try to get us to become ineffective as children of God. Whether he is trying to get us involved in things we ought not, or whether he is trying to get us uninvolved in things we ought to be involved in. You see, there are sins, as we, and I used to hear this expression all the time, but I don't hear it anymore, sins of omission and sins of commission. There are things that we omit that we need to be doing, but if the devil can get us uninterested, uninvolved, then he has us right where he wants us. One of the things that is very interesting about uh, some of the statements in the scriptures about, about those who are still sacrificing to God, they're still going through the motions of worship, but yet their life is separated from the Word of God. Psalm 50 is an excellent example of that. Here are people who are still continually sacrificing, making their burnt offerings unto the Lord. But God says through the psalmist, you're a people who have taken up with adulterers, you're people who have taken up with thieves, you're, you're people who are, are not using your tongues in the way you ought to use them. There, there were so many things about their lives that was making their worship unacceptable to God. And so we need to be watchful for areas wherein the devil is attacking us, trying to get us to do things we ought not, trying to get us to leave undone things we ought to be doing. At the same time, we need to be watchful for opportunities to do good. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul encouraged the brethren of Galatia to be not weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As ye therefore have opportunity, do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. In the Ephesian letter, chapter 2 and verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So there are opportunities that come our way to do good, to be involved in good works. As Paul said to Titus, a people zealous of good works. That, that describes the faithful child of God. And so we need to be watchful. We need to be watchful for souls that are lost, that need the gospel of Christ. Our Lord said that we ought to pray the Lord of harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his vineyard. And the reason is the field is white unto harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So we as children of God, need to be constantly watching for opportunities in that regard. So he says that they need to remember the received word, the word that they had, that they had heard. You might recall as well in 2 Peter chapter uh, 3 
as Peter was describing the kind of people that we ought to be. Verse 11, what manner of persons ought you to be? And he begins in verse 1 describing the kind of persons that we ought to be. And it, it, it speaks of people who use their memory, remember some things. You know, it's going to be sad if we remember some things too late, isn't it? When that uh, rich man died and was buried, lifted up his eyes in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom, pleaded for just a, a drop of water to cool his tongue. And Abraham said to him, Son, remember, that will probably be the most haunting memory that anyone could ever have. The memory of an opportunity to do what God wants us to do, but refuse to do it, continue to live in sin, and be lost eternally. When I think about people who hear the gospel over and over and over again and never become children of God, you die in that condition. One of these days you may well hear it said, do you remember the opportunities that you had that you ignored, that you refused to accept? Now you find yourself lost. Are people who have been baptized into Christ but, but have gone back into the world who are not faithful in service to God. You die in that condition and have, have the Lord or someone else say to you, remember the opportunities that you had to be a faithful child of God and, and you did not respond as God wanted you to respond. That's going to be a haunting experience that will be eternal in its nature. That's where these people needed to get back to. Remember what you've learned. Remember what you received. Remember what you've heard. And you hold fast to that. And then repent of those things that are amiss in your life. Because he said if you don't, I will come as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That's not the only place in the Bible that we have this kind of information. Peter again in 2 Peter chapter 3. We are taught that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in that context he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When you least expect it. When you're not ready for it. When you're unprepared in that regard. So they needed to, to get back and, and remember that the Lord is going to come again. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, emphasized that no man knows the day nor the hour when this world is coming to an end. He says only the Father knows that. We don't know that. It is amazing how many tele-evangelists and those are the only ones that I get an opportunity to hear or would take the opportunity to hear I suppose. But how many of those tele-evangelists have all of the answers as to when the Lord is going to return. We're in the either in the last days or be, we're coming quickly to the last days and you know the language that they use and They'll talk about all of the signs and wonders and so forth, indications that the end of the world is near. They don't know that. Only the Lord knows that. We don't know. That's why it is imperative that we remain ready at all times. And that's what he's trying to get these people to do. You have a name, but it's, it's incorrect. Your reputation is not the same as your character. So you need to repent of those things that are wrong with your character. Get your reputation and character in harmony with one another. Practice what you preach. That's what we need to do as children of God in that regard. So a tremendous lesson here in this regard for us. And, and he gives the comfort to those who are faithful children of God. Here's what's awaiting for the faithful. And so when you look at the church at Sardis and you see that reputation is not so important in the eyes of God as character. We need to think about ourselves in that regard as individuals and as a congregation to make sure that we have more than just a good reputation. I'm very confident that the church in Bremen has an excellent reputation for the most part. 
Is our character up to that same standard? I trust that it is. If it's not, then we need to make adjustments. We need to do exactly as these people that we're told to do and repent and then hold fast to what we know we need to be doing. And when we do that, then the preparation has been made. We have fulfilled our responsibility. And then the promise that he makes to these brethren, you can walk with me in white. You'll be clothed in white, symbolic of the purity of the faithful child of God. What about your life this morning as, as an individual? Having heard the word, have you responded? Have you received that word? Have you been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? If not, are you willing to run the risk of your life ending before you do something about that? And then the only thing you'll have in torment is a memory, a haunting memory of opportunities that you did not heed. Why would you run that risk? As a child of God who is not faithful in service to God, you're not involved in the work of the church, you're not faithful in attendance, you, you're just not into the work of the Lord. Why would you run the risk of leaving this world in that condition? Then having to face the haunting memory of opportunities just like today, when there was begging and pleading and teaching and instruction to get you to get back where you need to be, and you just put it off for whatever reason. The haunting memory eternally of what you did not do when you had the opportunity. If you need to make corrections in your life today, either to become a child of God or come back home, let us encourage you to do it as we stand together and sing this song.